Okay, I believe we're all about reconvened. Uh, I'll hand this over to Jack, who I believe has another video uh, to show us. Is that correct? Yes. Um, but before I do that, let me just take 30 seconds and uh, comment on the last discussion. And that is that we publish a Byzantine daily office in electronic form already. Um, it comes by email and there's a smartphone app as well. And it's updated every day with the hours and Vespers uh, with the propers inserted. So people don't need their books. All they need to do is open up the app or look at their inbox. And uh, we provide at least one way in which they can pray the hours. And um, it may not be a big congregation or a large volume, but we do have about 150 people a day who open the app or read their email. So uh, we've at least got something to uh, try to restore the use of the hours and <laughs> sacred time. So our next greeting comes from His Eminence, um, Archbishop Elpidophorus of America, the Greek Orthodox uh, Archdiocese of the United States. Uh, he was a speaker last year and he's very graciously sent us a greeting for this year. Distinguished participants, honored guests, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, please accept my heartfelt greetings and blessings upon the commencement of the 25th Oriental Lumen Conference. As we pray for the swift abatement of the COVID-19 pandemic and our collective isolation, I am encouraged by the continued meeting of this conference to uphold its mission of ecumenical dialogue and encounter among our sister churches. Allow me to also acknowledge the long evity of the Orientale Lumen Foundation as you embark on this 25th anniversary conference and bear new fruits of ecumenism for the 21st century. Concerning the theme for this event, liturgy and scripture, praying the word of God, the interplay between liturgy and Holy Scripture is of vital importance to our conception of self as Christians and the manner and attitude in which we encounter one another in the light and love of the divine Logos, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It is in this spirit of love and in the spirit of the desire for encounter with others that we enter into dialogue. Here is the place where we can behold the mystery of our sanctification by God's truth, as his word is truth and is proclaimed as such in every divine liturgy. Although the customs and traditions that revolve around the liturgy may vary among us, the reading of Holy Scriptures stands as a sacramental experience by which we may lead a spiritual life both thinking and doing all those things that are pleasing to you, as we again declare during the Divine Liturgy. Beginning with my keynote address to the conference last year on the theme Liturgy and Icons, I continue to be encouraged by the gathering of this conference and the dialogues undertaken by participants who welcome from many segments of the Catholic and Orthodox Churches. Reverting back to the theme of liturgy and icons, it is in conferences and dialogues like this that the quest for Christian unity can be advanced. To that effect, I pray that the deliberations among the participants, the presentations of the plenary speakers, and the fellowship among you all may be fruitful as you place the Holy Scriptures at the center of your dialogue and move forward with the message of the world always within you. May God bless and keep you always, especially now as you endeavor to be sanctified by his truth. I wish you all a successful conference. We sincerely thank his eminence for supporting us and his encouraging words. And I will now turn the floor back over to Father Andrew 
and uh, continue on the dialogue and conversation and try to address some of the questions that have been coming in. Father? Very good. Yeah. So I invite you all in this last uh, this last few moments, if you would like to add a question, uh, please put it in the chat box and uh, we'll, we'll pop it in the q and I'll put it in the queue. I have uh, two questions um, to three different people uh, to begin. Um, first, I'll begin with uh, Father Marco, and then I'll, I'll move on also to Brian and Daniel, and maybe you can uh, respond in sequence. Uh, so, Father Marco, uh, you're a very accurate uh, sort of geometric representation of sacramentality, um, of, you know, the sort of triangular structure of how we interpret and incorporate the Psalms. Uh, one of the things that sort of struck uh, me was uh, the fact that in geometry, well, geometry uh, uh, delivers to us uh, figures and shapes that don't normally occur uh, in the living world, right? They're rarefied, that is, they're sort of, sort of rarefied versions of naturally occurring shapes, but a point and a line and a plane, um, we, we don't have anything that approximates such flatness, a circle, we don't have anything that approximates such perfection in the natural world, but in geometry, uh, we're able to sort of hypothesize uh, that perfection. And so I, I guess my question then for you uh, might be, um, what are the things uh, that can frustrate the perfection of the cube, of the sacramentality that might uh, we encounter between the congregation and God that's connected uh, by the bottom of that box? You know, in the same way, what might be the things uh, that can frustrate, um, you know, the, the actual uh, creation of that perfect triangle uh, of the psalm given to us by God, uh, interpreting uh, in the voice of Christ and in the church and our own uh, adding of the I and the we. Um, so that, that, that's just, um, and how to overcome those practical barriers uh, so that we uh, can be perfect ge uh, uh, <laughs> geometrical shapes, right? And then for you, Brian and Daniel, if you can maybe speak a little bit about maybe in your own life about what this sort of manual and practical and hand-on engagement with manuscripts has done for you uh, in your own appropriation of the word of God. Okay, then I, I go first. Um, so this, these, yeah, the cuboid and the triangle are simply used for, uh, for classes uh, because I wanted to uh, have so I, I love math, math, by the way, and I nearly studied mathematics instead of theology, but I, I made the right decision to <laughs> study theology and become a priest. Um, I, with the cuboid, it's, everything starts with what we see, what we hear, or what we listen to. But that's not the, this is the surface. But liturgy leads us into the depth of the encounter with God. And this is what I wanted to show with the cuboid. Of course, there is also a question of, because you ask what is, can be in the way, it's also about our active participation. So I use this cuboid also for active participation. We, first we listen or we hear things on a very superficial way, but then on the second level, we are brought into the community of the church and that at the end, uh, encounter God, though it depends on us whether we are willing, whether we are ready to to listen. For it. already listening is an act of active participation, as you pointed out, the active participation, making the connections, as uh, Father Tad pointed out, from the reading in the evening to the gospel, or in the Roman Catholic Church from the Old Testament reading to the gospel, that's an act of active participation. So listening is the first step. Um, all from the other perspective, from the reader, if the reader is not well prepared, then it's difficult to really get the message across. Um, so the, also the, in a practical way to foster the preparation of lectors is helping to get the barriers away and not only knowing, uh, teaching them how to read in public, but more or less to understand that they are a mouthpiece of God who speaks through them. And I think the theological understanding helps to, um, to overcome some barriers. 
uh, or to give more attention to it, more dedication to it. Uh, about the triangle, um, not every psalm has this triangle. Some psalms are more, as Athanasius says, this personal. By the way, I use this triangle also to, to, um, to illustrate Athanasius, his letter to Marcellinus. Um, this personal um, yeah, interpretation, I think it's a matter of experience. The more you praise the Psalms, the more you connect your own life to it. I think I say always it's the what really matters is not to understand the full text, but to find your own life in between the lines and to connect your own life with what you have in the book or in, in the app. And so th that's experience. And by doing so, you you gather more and more personal experience and the, that opens also your eyes for a Christological interpretation. And sometimes, and I still remember the first time when I saw it, how on Palm Sunday in the Vespers, how the, the, um, the, the first um, psalm in the Roman office is directly, a, the antiphon is a direct quote of Christ. And so it encourages us to read this psalm in the voice of Christ. But of course, I realized, no, it's me speaking this. Um, and so to make the connection of a personal and Christological interpretation also um, is a matter of yeah, experience and prayer. And it, at the end, it's God's grace. It's God who then shows us more and more to appreciate these texts because he is present and speaks to us in the Psalms. And so God, you're of course right, doesn't speak with triangles. And so that's a human way of thinking of it, but he can use that perhaps to, and, and for all of us here, um, to get a new awareness of God's presence in the Psalms or in his word. And having the awareness helps us to listen to his voice. Father Marco, if I could uh, just kind of respond a little bit to that uh, as uh, as somebody who has been a lector, uh, when you were talking about the lector as sometimes interfering uh, with the word, I was suddenly reminded of uh, one of the uh, epigrams of Marshall, uh, who said that uh, I wrote the words that you're reading, but when you read them badly, they become yours. <laughs> And you know, literally, that's what that's what can happen with it with a lector is that it gets in the way. Um, is uh, I was in a men's group in uh, the last parish that I was in, and we were doing various uh, readings and studies, and we were uh, studying about uh, the lectio divina, and um, the idea of taking it and slowing it down and just reading it. And I, I remember uh, on one occasion I had read something and was prepared to read it aloud and it was, I was stumbling over it. And it was just taking myself out of it, stepping back and just taking it slowly that all of a sudden the natural sense flowed through. And it was, uh, it was a, a, a passage that was tricky uh, as, as some passages are. And then the third thought on that, uh, there was a, uh, a time when, because I had studied classics, uh, I was asked to read uh, the Pentecost narrative uh, in Greek in an American Roman Catholic church. And um, so I, I read it through and everybody was nodding along. And at the end, I threw in uh, Hologos to uh, Curio. And the congregation all said, Amen. And I thought, wow, <laughs> how did that happen? Uh, so yeah, sometimes, sometimes as the, the lector, it's, it's, about, it's about the humility and trying to remember what, what the function of it is. Um, one of the things that uh, always strikes me about 
Psalters and books of hours, since we've talked so much about uh, about those, is um, especially in the Western tradition. In the beginning, uh, you always have the calendar, and uh, the calendar lists all the great feasts uh, of the of the church year, uh, month by month. Uh, but then you also have the um, the saints of local importance, and uh, they're listed uh, there, and then finally, you will find some uh, uh, some notations. Uh, some of our uh, some of our manuscripts have private notations in there. So, uh, as Sister Voss was saying uh, about how uh, Father Hart would always be able to go through all the all the the memories of who was whose feast day it was, uh, is that people have longed to do that. They've always done that, and I think my experience of working with manuscripts is actually seeing those notations especially in the calendar where that's how they're using it and directing themselves uh, for the, uh, the prayers you can also see in some of the the manuscripts um real real devotion um uh, in some cases, you'll look at it in an image and it's smeared. It, it might be the Theotokos. And it's smeared. Why is it smeared? Because over the centuries, it's been kissed so many times. And uh, just to me, just seeing the, the faith uh, on the written page, not necessarily by the scribe, but by, by others over time. Uh, I think that that has brought a lot, uh, a, a lot to life for me. And I, I know for for me, I'll, I'll share two things of how dealing with manuscripts uh, helps my my own practice. One, uh, as a scholar, it's sometimes easy to forget that the scripture I'm studying is scripture, and it. It's easy just to think of interesting theories to put pieces together, um, but dealing with the, the physical reality of something that multiple people spent time copying, correcting, and then passing down reminds me, as, as Brian was saying, of, of the devotion that was involved in this, in this, and then thus reminds me of what it is that I'm looking at, what it is that I'm holding and studying. And, and so just the, the physicality of it is in itself a reminder. And then second, I've developed myself a habit of copying texts by hand uh, as an aid to study uh, and devotion. So this can be either just for, for my own personal study. If I'm working on a text, I will copy it. Uh, if I'm going to bring something to teach in any group, I will copy it usually in both English and in Greek until I could do that by memory. And so trying to use uh, the reading, muttering, writing, as the ancient scribes did even, uh, as an aid to my own uh, devotion, memory, and teaching. Well, thank you for that. Uh, I'd like to bring uh, to the fore some of the prepared questions by some of our participants uh, that uh, speak a little bit to sort of the liturgical cycle, maybe to uh, give this to the liturgists. Uh, to kind of have us sort through how uh, the services and the books themselves are ordered. One question uh, was about the collections of prayers and hymns for Vespers and Orthros Matins. It's arranged seasonally, obviously, in the Lenten Triodian Festival Menaean. This person wants to know, where can we find sort of the daily commemorations uh, in, uh, for the different Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday of the regular days of the week? Uh, and, and what are the different um, um, uh, dedications uh, to that? Um, secondly, uh, just uh, maybe to speak a little bit about uh, some of the names of some famous hymnographers uh, that uh, uh, come up in these liturgical books and their importance. So if anybody wants to remark on that. Uh, well, about the weekday commemorations uh, that uh, the weekday system of the Byzantine Rite is governed by the liturgical book known as the Octo Ichos, right? Uh, and the system, uh, it's something that we constantly go through on my little podcast um, of the weekdays. Uh, it's it's uh, obviously Sunday is the day of the resurrection. That's the main theme of a Sunday. Um, Monday is the day of the angels and other bodiless powers. There's all sorts of layers of interesting meaning in the actual structure of the liturgical week. Of course, these memories, I will go through the rest of them in a second, but they are suppressed when there is a great feast going on 
or the after feast or post feast, like right now, uh, we are still celebrating Pentecost. So the, the hymnography of Pentecost is suppressing the weekday. It takes a back seat. So no hymnography of the angels from the Octoichos. But Monday being the day of the angels, there is an interesting uh, reason for them to be at the beginning of the week uh, because the seven days of the week reflect in some shape or form the theology of the days of creation. And this is not uh, immediately evident in the memories, but we know that the angels, if you look at some of the, uh, you know, in the book of Jubilees among the Qumran finds, uh, there are interesting uh, also elements of theologizing the days of the week, but the angels, there are texts uh, that are speculating on, you know, that we don't know when the angels were created, but it was basically agreed. Some of the great fathers write about this as well. And then John of Damascus, as usual, summarizes the opinion that basically they were probably created first somehow before everything else. But anyway, so the angels are commemorated on a Monday. Uh, uh, then on a Tuesday, it's St. John the Baptist. That's his day. That's his hymnography will be on a Tuesday when the Octoihos is on. That means there's no great feast or post feast or pre feast, uh, for feast. Wednesday, uh, for uh, reasons that are very interesting to contemplate, are days of the cross. The cross is planted in the middle of the week. Uh, and an interesting difference between, say, in our Orthodox communion, right, but also Byzantine Catholic, in the different languages, the number of the days is different. So say a Wednesday, which according to uh, the Jewish count uh, in, in Hebrew is Yom Ravie, and it is Tetarti in the Greek. So it would be the fourth day and smack in the middle of the week. The numerology is also significant because you have three to this side and three to the other side. But in Slavic languages, the fourth day is a Thursday, as in Chitvirk in the Russian from Chitiri, which means four, that's a Thursday. So, you know, as far as differences in calendar with one in the same communion, well, much deeper and farther back goes cultural differences in the theologizing and conceptualization and meaning of weekdays. So the discrepancies between Gregorian and Julian calendars that are very superficial, really, um, you know, or the difference in 13 days, uh, we have deeper like differences on a weekday level um, that did not hinder communion or were ever a topic. Anyway, Thursday um, is uh, the day of the Holy Apostles and St. Nicholas. St. Nicholas is added on to that group. They are the theme of a Thursday. Uh, you can see roughly a progression into the New Testament because we had on a Tuesday, a transitional day between the beginning of the week and the middle transitional figure was John the Baptist, the forerunner, the one that's preparing the ways of the Lord. But then on the other uh, side of the middle, the transitional figures are the holy apostles on a Thursday there is a rough chronology, it's not perfect, but they are the ones that, uh, you know, carry into the era of the church. And then one of the prominent successors to the apostles and significantly participant in the first ecumenical council, according to tradition, St. Nicholas, on a Thursday, uh, it's, uh, you see it in other structures of the church calendar, for example, celebrating the fathers of the first ecumenical council one weekend before Pentecost, connecting them, you know, the fathers of the first ecumenical council with the mission of the apostles. Um, we see this pairing up to stress continuity between the conciliarity that's made possible by Pentecost and the whole business of apostolicity and the continuity stressed uh, in the first ecumenical council. Fridays are a day I didn't mention that Wednesday together with the cross, um, you know, in the center of the week as the center of history, the cross is the center from which we read also the Old Testament backwards. 
we read everything after the cross. So the center of time being the cross on the fourth center day of the week. It's also uh, a Friday uh, is the day of the cross, but also of the Theotokos, uh, that is another central mystery of Christianity. Not so much the person of the Theotokos, I have to say, but her as enabling being this vital uh, enabler or vessel of the incarnation. So two themes that go on a Wednesday and a Friday. Friday uh, is the day Paraskivi of preparation. So the mystery of preparing for what? A Friday prepares for the Sabbath. The eternal rest is made possible, peace from above, through carrying the cross and through being church, the Theotokos, aside from being the, you know, the vessel for the incarnation, she's also traditionally the image of mother church. Being church is in some way also sharing the vocation of the birth giver of God who internalizes the word. Everybody as church is called to internalize the word through various levels of communion and then to give birth to him in sometimes the martyric, painful labor pains, right? Sharing him in our surroundings. So Paraskivi Friday, uh, preparation, paving the way to the Sabbath that on a Saturday, uh, we uh, there's a lot of literature about the theology, both of Saturday and Sunday, but the Sabbath has been, according to the classic book on Sunday by Willy Rohrdorf, right, uh, is really extended in Christianity to all the time. We never abolished the Sabbath, but it's always the Sabbath. The Lord who promises to bring us Anapovsin, right, uh, at, at, towards the end of Matthew 11, 28 to 30, uh, learn from me, you know, uh, and so forth. Take your yoke upon my yoke upon you, uh, you know, and I will bring you anapovsin or peace. So it is through the cross from the Friday, that preparation that we come to that eternal peace. But Saturday to, in our weekday system is uh, pointing us towards eternal rest. It's the day always of the deceased commemorating the dead. Sometimes that's accentuated by special memorial Saturdays throughout the church year uh, or Saturday of souls, as we say it in, in the English um, sometimes. Anyway, it's also the day of all saints. And you can't distinguish between the two because how do we know? All saints and deceased are a category that are sort of the same. Originally in church hymnography, you'll notice that any memorial service always is appealing to the original saints, the martyrs. So the prayers to the holy martyrs. That's it about those uh, days of the week. I would add that um, uh, in the so-called regular period, uh, I don't really like the, the term regular because uh, I mean, what is regular and what is irregular in liturgy, uh, it's not really clear. But anyway, uh, the question that was asked uh, didn't deal with neither the Triodion or the Pentecostalian period, but the, as we can say the rest of the year. To the, to the hymnology uh, of the, of the um, Octoichos or the Paracliti, Paraclitiki that uh, Sister Vasta was referring, we also add the hymnology of the saint of the day in the Menlologion. So this is why the, we cannot actually, to, to, to fulfill, to serve the Byzantine rite uh, in uh, in its fullness, as it uh, is being prescribed by the typicon, you cannot just have a breviary in 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 your hand. You need a lot of books, and this is why I think the application of uh, Jack Fiegel uh, and um, the text he's providing perhaps uh, could be helpful uh, for the people who don't have the the full liturgical books at home. Um, I wanted to respond to the second question concerning the hymnographers. 
Uh, of course, in the liturgical books, uh, many hymns are attributed to different hymnographers. For example, some hymns are attributed to St. John of Damascus, others to St. Theodore the Studite that we have mentioned earlier, that was mentioned in one of the um, lectionaries of the Bible Museum. Uh, also, other hymns are, for example, attributed to his brother St. Joseph, the ethnographer, etc., etc. There are many, many. Some even we have St. Cassiani, uh, a woman. Uh, all hymnographers were not only men. Some uh, hymnography was written also by uh, women in the church. Some hymns are anonymous. And also, uh, sometimes we find in the different editions and uh, also within the different manuscripts, sometimes we, 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 we find the same hymnography attributed to different authors. So some of the attributions are, uh, dub, uh, uh, are uh, dubious. I mean, we, we don't know exactly uh, if the attribution is, is uh, correct or not. There have, been, uh, there have been a lot of scientific articles um, written on the uh, attribution of the hymnography. Perhaps if you look in the bibliography within my book, the uh, typical decoded, you will find some more details. Uh, I see Sister Vasa wants to add something to this. No. I, I wasn't gonna add anything, Your Eminence. I was just nodding, I was engaged. <laughs> but you're welcome if you want to add. Well, uh, you know, uh, I'm happy to talk a little bit too much, my dear friend. I, um, I, we talked about, you know, it is an interesting thing. It's a fascinating topic, the hymnographers, because, you know, the thing is that uh, there is something in our culture about anonymity. And it's interesting that the tradition actually really tries to assign authorship you know, you're not supposed, I know the Greeks, like iconographers will sign their icons, but that's like a no-no. Your name is supposed to be, especially for monastics, you know, people will be reluctant sometimes to mention my last name. They think that they have to say Sister Vasa because in like Russian monasticism, you're supposed to sort of relinquish your identity to a certain extent. Um, but it's interesting, the culture of assigning uh, authorship uh, we talked about it on my podcast now because we're doing the canon of two canons of Pentecost that are one of the greatest, two of the greatest hits, you know, of Byzantine hymnography. You just can't get enough of it, you know. So the first one being written by Cosmos of Mayuma, the adoptive brother of St. John of Damascus, right? Uh, they both become monks, uh, even though he joins the family of John of Damascus up in Damascus, they become monks in St. Sava Slavra. But the second canon of Pentecost, um, is uh, attributed to a certain uh, Kir uh, Ioannis of Arklas. And it's been shown, there's some pre-revolutionary Russian studies on hymn hymnographers and hymnography, right? And he has been shown to be John of Damascus. So the greater, he, he is placed second. He's better known, obviously, John of Damascus than his adoptive brother, Cosmas. But that second canon is uh, does belong to John of Damascus, but they say one of the theories is that was his family name. This, uh, it says Jana Arakliskova in the Slavonic. That's just a fun fact, but um, sometimes when you talk about it, I find that my subscribers comment on this. They're like, oh, it's a different, you know, like what Father Marco mentioned about announcing the authorship of Paul which by the way is in scholarship oftentimes contested about also the Pauline epistles, right? Nobody now would say, as St. Paul says in Hebrews, they usually say the author of Hebrews, right? Even Orthodox will say that, even though it's like, oh, you know. Um, that's all, I'm gonna abruptly end because that's all I wanted to interject. <laughs> Yeah. Well, and just uh, one, you know, just sort of brief aside, I think of Cosmos Mayuma because he's also somebody whose very identity is contested as well, right? Um, uh, Alexander Kuzdan, you know, doesn't seem to think he exists. But even if he did exist, one of the interesting ways that we're able to see how these hymnographers uh, uh, attribute themselves uh, is through acrostics, right? And so they, where they literally will embed 
their very name uh, into the first line uh, of each tropar, you know, letter by letter, right, going on. And so it's a way in which uh, uh, I think there's something uh, rather, we don't really know why people use acrostics as literary devices. Uh, but one of the suggestions that we can make is that they're, it's to ensure that they're kind of given over uh, to the prayer of the church, you know, that uh, they're sort of being enveloped uh, by, uh, you know, some sort of divine inspiration. Um, yes. Uh, well, very good. That brings us to, I think, a question to ask uh, that uh, comes from Dr. Zollner. And, and since we were talking so much about exposing people to the Liturgy of the Hours, uh, sort of incorporating people into, uh, you know, this uh, greater reception of the scriptural tradition uh, as it's manifested in uh, the liturgical life of our church, uh, Dr. Zollner, you know, kind of brings to the fore the fact that we're living in this uh, kind of COVID age, everything's via live streamed. Um, and he makes a comment that I think I'd like to turn in a question. He's, now that so much is being live streamed, I've been able to work more into my day in terms of the hours, especially matins, vespers, royal hours, as well as morning liturgies. Uh, since people have been able to offer this as a live stream, it makes a big difference, at least him. I guess in, in your opinion, you're the experts here, uh, to what effect positively or detriment negatively has this live stream church been uh, for our own uh, in liturgical lives? We're on the other side of it, I would hope now. So it's, it's probably good to do a little uh, calculus on it. I think there are positive and negative aspects. When the COVID uh, pandemic started, I think we, the at least we, the Orthodox, uh, I will not pronounce myself on the Roman Catholics, but the Orthodox, uh, I think we were uh, the less prepared uh, to do live stream uh, services on the internet. Uh, for example, I think uh, Protestants, are ahead of us with using technologies, modern technologies for worship. But as a whole, I've noticed that all over the world, uh, some better, some less better, but as a whole, the Orthodox on, and on different level, whether it would be at the level of official live streaming from patriarchates, from uh, dioceses, metrop metropolises, or even parishes started live streaming um, services. Uh, personally, I think that this is very positive because this gives an opportunity uh, for people who usually would not have time to go to church because of other commitments um, to have the opportunity to follow some services. I've heard I've heard some comments from lay people saying, oh, this service is so, was so beautiful. It was the first time I've attended such a service. Of course, because it's a service that would be served during the week uh, when the person would be at work or, for example, at school or whatever. So there are positive uh, aspects of it. The negative or the danger of it is that some people would be tempted to now to follow church services from home and stop going actually to the church. And I think we, the clergy, will be uh, experiencing our, our challenge uh, after the pandemic uh, will be having people coming back to the church. Uh, but it's just some ideas for for uh, for discussion and brainstorming. I don't. I do not pretend to have uh, resolved the issue. The way I'd put it is this: It remains to be seen whether this is going to be a positive or a negative development. If I can simplify, I'd simplify this way: If continuing to stream services enables people to engage more with the church, as Vladika just described, then it's good. However, there's a slippery slope where it can lead to disengagement. In other words, their connection with the church uh, is attenuated because eh, I'll watch 
the service at home. I don't really have to belong to a community. I don't have to go. So I think it's going to be a balance between this further engagement, which is good, or this tendency to disengagement, which is bad. And we just have to see how that's going to work out. I am not willing to take an absolutist fundamentalist stance that said all of this is bad. Why? Because we've never done it before. Therefore, we're doing it now. It must be evil. That's ridiculous. Because what's happened, when you look at, again at the history of Israel, think about it. Israel's leadership was carted off in the Babylonian exile, about 5,000 people. All right. The temple was destroyed. They couldn't go to the temple because it was gone. But what did they do there in the crucible of Babylon? They came up with the, the synagogue. The synagogue really is an institution was born in the exile and it comes back with the exiles and it coexisted with the temple after the exile. The horror, the pain of the exile led them to come up with a solution to keep the people engaged. That was the synagogue. And when the exile concluded, and the temple, the second temple was built, they were still able to keep the synagogue as a way of engagement in the towns far away from the temple where people couldn't get to the temple. And when the second temple was destroyed, Judaism down to our present day has as its central institution to keep the people <clears throat> engaged is the synagogue. So COVID was sort of our exile in a way. And I think that the exile produced some very bad things and some very good things. And I think COVID for us is going to do the same. And it all comes back to whether it fosters engagement or disengagement with the church in the long run. And that only time will tell. Yeah, Father Marco, yeah. Yeah, a short comment. Uh, I agree with, the, with both of you. And I think the, the challenge will be how we bring people back to church. And I think, um, First, the community aspect is the first, but then also the sacraments. And f fostering the Eucharist as part of the real participation, I, all of those who only participate online do participate, but of course not in the full sense of how the liturgy intends people to participate. Then a second, what might be a benefit, for instance, for the liturgy of the hours in the Western tradition or in the Roman tradition, the, for instance, the Vespers, you can pray the Vespers in, in 10, 15 minutes. Nobody would go 20 minutes to the church, pray for 10, 15 minutes and go 20 minutes back. So we have some parishes who now in, have Zoom meetings for Vespers, not many. But I think this could be really beneficial for the whole project of fostering the liturgy of the hours. I, I agree with what everybody has said, is that there, there are pluses, there are minuses. Um, uh, like Father Ted, uh, I stayed uh, 30 years in one, in one location and assumed that I would retire there. Um, but then, uh, then I got this offer to uh, work for the museum and I went out to Oklahoma City and was there for four years and we moved back to the east coast to the dc area and i got to uh move into our apartment and come into the office two weeks before COVID hit and so uh, most of my first year here uh in dc literally has been spent in uh <laughs> being uh, at home uh so our parish, our particular parish, did not have the capability for um, for having a uh, <clears throat> a remote uh, virtual uh, liturgy. What that meant was that we've been members of the parish for over a year, but it wasn't until just May that it opened up again, and we could start going. Uh, uh, we could start going every Sunday, and so how do you fill that gap? with your new parish. Uh, what we did actually is we would uh, look at uh, the virtual uh, the virtual liturgy from the two uh, parishes that we had belonged to before moving. And uh, it, 
it was it was interesting. It, it, it kept our connections uh, and the idea of the universal church uh, was very strong in, in that in that we were part of something that was going on elsewhere. Um, but it is not it's just not the same as actually actually being present uh, and being able to participate fully. So there are there are pluses in that you can have people, you can engage them and keep them going, but it does not really replace being there and being surrounded by the congregation, hearing the music, uh, and of course, the Eucharist. I have a question that I could ask. I'm just curious. You know, you talked a lot about memorization as important and the muscle memory that comes from singing together or reciting together. And I agree with that. We have a problem in English, don't we, where we don't have a common translation that we all use. <laughs> right. And, you know, that's not true in Slavonic. It's not true in the Septuagint. These were common texts. And even the Vulgate. I mean, you know, the Latin text followed. There was a basic text that everyone could learn. It is really frustrating that we don't have an English version of the Psalms that we can all use. I mean, think about it. We all say the Our Father the same way in English, basically. But we don't have a translation of the Psalms that we can all use and that would fix the words <clears throat> of the Psalms in our minds. Mm -hmm. And in my own jurisdiction, we've been using you know, one translation of the Psalms for decades. And then all of a sudden, they decided to change the translation of the Psalms that are used. Nothing is worse than trying to recite aloud Psalms that you've memorized in your mind according to one version and reading a new version where they change some of the word. It's very unsettling. And people who take an absolutist stance on such things really should not move from an established translation that everyone's used to a new translation that no one knows and that people trip over. So I just bring that up. I mean, has this been a problem in other jurisdictions as well? Yeah, well, I, I would say, and even more to the point, you know, to have an established translation, but even the competency uh, available to make sure that in our liturgical translations that uh, we're able to hear, see, and read uh, where the liturgical, where the scriptural allusions are. Yes. And if we, uh, you know, and to be able to thread that in our own translation, sometimes that is lost. I mean, I think of the work of, uh, you know, Ephraim, Father Ephraim Lash of Blessed Memory, um, who was just so good uh, at making that apparent, uh, even with the acrimonious footnotes in so many of his liturgical translations, uh, because he was able to uh, kind of be able to seize the scripture in the hymnography uh, so well. Um, so it, it is quite a problem because you have this sort of consistent, um, sort of uh, nexus of and, and sort of linguistic uh, internal coherence in Slavonic and Greek that we just haven't been able to accomplish because we lack, um, uh, well, the laziness ultimately, because it's, <laughs> it's just work uh, that re requires a lot of uh, minds uh, and a lot of uh, time uh, to get through. No, I wouldn't call it laziness. I mean, uh, that's, that's probably, that's rather rude of me. So many of the liturgical translations uh, that we've experienced um, were people who just are urgently trying to get the words out in a language that people can understand. It's this urgent pastoral need, right? And so like, let's get this out uh, and, uh, you know, make it widely uh, manifest and um, sort of that urgency um, sort of, uh, well, it's, it's great impulse. And uh, we're living with so many of those texts and we stand on the shoulders of giants because of that at the same time, um, you know, kind of the hastiness to get things out sort of overlooks some of these more uh, eternal things. Uh, yeah, um, we, uh, we're a little bit of time. I don't know if uh, anybody else has something really quickly to wrap up on this point. Otherwise, I'll, I'll leave it uh, to Jack uh, to, uh, you know, come forward. Yeah, to, uh, one, two more quick, very quick comments. Um, in terms of getting people to recite the Psalms, I did something in my parish for years that at Vespers, for instance, Psalm 103, rather than just having one person recite it while the people, you know, think about what they're going to have for dinner that night, I had all the people recite that Psalm together. Mm -hmm. And that drew people into that Psalm. Psalm 103 is used at every Vesper service, basically, so it draws them into it. 
The second point I want to make is in retirement, I'm attending an OCA parish, and I don't know whether this is a general Russian practice or not, Vladika, but it pre-sanctified for the, you know, the uh, three antiphons, you know, where you, they recite the Psalms, the chanters will sing the first half of the verse and the people chant back the second half of the verse antiphonally back and forth. So you have the chanters and the congregation. And I'll tell you how much of the psalm sticks in your mind. They do use a melody that's sort of catchy, not fancy, but catchy. And it, it fixes the words in the mind. So coming up with song psalms that way and having people actively render the second half of a verse to the uh, chanters, the first half of the verse, it really does help to fix the words of the psalm in the mind. Those are my two last sort of uh, random observations. Thank you very much. Hey, thank you, Father Ted. I'll, I'll just uh, put a footnote to that and to say that in the Ruthenian practice, we chant all the psalms by the whole congregation at every service. Oh, there right. is no notion of just a reader just doing the hexasalmus or anything like that. And it's either antiphonally back and forth or it's verse by verse or everyone chants everything. So, um, as but as you pointed out, or it was pointed out earlier, the Ruthenians always have had strong congregational singing as a, as a tradition going back to the mountains. <laughs> you know, I heard a funny story. It's not funny, it's actually a tragic, sad story that when the church after the fall of communism, after the church among the Ukrainians was able to come up from underground, the people lacked liturgical books, but they could depend on the older people having memorized the prayers and the services and the Psalms, that they were able to have the services even though they didn't have a printed book in front of them. That's how much it was internalized. God knows yeah. the, you know, these babushki, you know, their, their grandchildren weren't able to do it, but they were able to do it. And that shows how much it can become internalized when you're actively participating. I, I was at a village in the Carpathian Mountains on Christmas, and not a single person had a book, but mm -hmm. they did the entire liturgy with all the propers completely from memory. Yes. Uh, well, thank you all very, very much, uh, panelists. And uh, let me uh, try to wrap this up as quickly as I can. I do have a, a few sort of a closing remarks to make, and that is to thank everyone who's been on the, the uh, webinar, and I hope that you've enjoyed our panel discussions. Those uh, questions that we received uh, that uh, have not been uh, brought up, we will try to uh, get answers back to everyone as best we can. Uh, not sure how we can do that, but, but we will try. Um, my very, very uh, sincere thank you to all the panelists for participating uh, in today's uh, discussion and for preparing such wonderful videos. And at this time, I would like to present to all the speakers an icon representing today's conference of uh, the four evangelists, uh, custom designed and made just for these uh, panelists and for this conference. And I'm going to use an idea from the Star Trek TV show that we're going to transport this through the internet to all the speakers. It worked, Jack, it worked. It worked. <laughs> and we've improved on it in that we've added duplication to the transport. <laughs> Thank you all, that was that was brilliant, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank yep. you and, and everyone. Um, I'd like to thank Yvonne McKinney, who's been our host and the Washington Theological Consortium for organizing uh, the webinar and uh, pushing all the buttons and getting everyone connected. Uh, it was uh, very, very well done, Yvonne. Congratulations, thank you. Um, if you, you haven't seen, uh, these lectures are in cooperation with, or not this lecture, but this conference uh, and the lectures um, are being uh, jointly sort of organized by the Washington Theological Consortium but also uh, the Byzantine Catholic Seminary in Pittsburgh, who will be offering the lectures and this panel discussion as a one credit online course in July and August uh, for one credit towards a master's in theology. They have a full online MAT program. And so uh, students will be able to, to register and sign on and get one credit 
for listening to all of your lectures and having a conversation with Sandy Collins, who runs the program in Pittsburgh. Uh, and so we're thankful for their uh, joint uh, cooperation and collaboration with this. Um, related to the slideshow I had done for the conference and um, uh, showed examples, uh, we've actually uh, had some orders. I'll just put a little plug in for the book called Icons of Scripture, where I've collected 130 images that have a connection to a scripture passage, and we've now published it in a, as a book. It's available on the ECPUB's website, uh, and uh, it, it relates to this conference and the idea of, uh, of scriptures and liturgy, uh, but also icons in scripture. Related also to books, I will put in a selfish plug for Father Ted's collection. Uh, his lectionary we published as a book of thematic readings, both in paperback and in hardbound. So if you want to learn more, um, you can get the book with where he puts all of the text together that he's proposed uh, for connecting the Sunday gospel reading to the Saturday Vesper reading. So Father Ted, thank you for those books and thank you for your proposed ideas. And uh, indeed it is in Father Petrus's Tipicon that all the Ruthenians get. And in my daily uh, Vesper service this year, um, I've been using your readings for the Saturday night readings on for Vespers in the app um, of uh, the electronic version. Um, last but not least, I'd like to uh, do a quick announcement of a coming attraction, and that is OLTV, or Intel Illumin Television, uh, is going to hopefully within the next few weeks launch a new streaming video website and a subscription service for Roku TV. Uh, all of the lectures of Father Robert Taft, Metropolitan Callistos, and others, past plenary sessions from Oriental Illumin conferences, uh, liturgies, pilgrimages, um, hundreds of hours of material we're going to make available on the website. And we're also going to make them available as downloadable audio podcasts that people will be able to listen le to lectures um, like they do anything else uh, on your phone and uh, as an audio subscription. And that'll be a new website we'll be announcing and getting the word out in the next few weeks. I think that's all I have to say other than next year, Oriental Illumin 26, uh, we've already started some planning for it. We'd appreciate any input if anyone has some ideas for a theme or speakers. The dates uh, are likely like 90% to be June 20 to 23. That's this same third week of June. Uh, our normal schedule is to start on a Monday evening, have all day Tuesday and Wednesday, uh, and um, then finish on Thursday morning. Um, and I uh, uh, hope that everyone will be able to join us. Uh, we're planning to make it a hybrid um, so that we're gonna take advantage of this new Zoom technology but yet also meet in person. So there'll be a face-to-face -face option for people to come and meet each other and pray together. But then we will also broadcast all of the lectures and the prayer services uh, over the internet through Zoom. So to conclude, we have one last greeting video. Uh, Yvonne, if you could queue up. Um, this is from Archbishop Sviatoslav of Kiev. He's the head of the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church. Uh, he's uh, sent greetings to us in the past, and uh, I have a special honor uh, with him uh, that we recorded his liturgy in Westminster Cathedral in London, even rather than the BBC. And so I'm uh, so thankful uh, for that honor and uh, uh, would like to introduce Archbishop Sviatoslav of Kiev. Dear friends in Christ, I send you my warmest greetings and blessings with the 25th anniversary Oriental Lumen Conference in June 2021 to be held virtually again this year because of the pandemic. I pray to God that this will end soon and you'll be able to meet in person once again next year. I congratulate you 
and their organizers for continuing this grassroots ecumenical dialogue among Roman Catholic, Eastern Orthodox, Eastern Catholic, and Oriental Orthodox Christians for the past 25 years. This has been an amazing accomplishment. Your meetings have been an inspiration that has helped continue the international dialogue through good times and bad. The theme for this year, Liturgy and Scripture, Praying the Word of God, is a powerful foundation for ecumenical dialogue. It connects the foundation of our faith, the Word of God, to the work of the people when gathered in prayer, the Divine Liturgy. Each of us experience liturgy in a different way, much as each of our churches express the faith through different customs, traditions, and expressions. Yet, it is the one faith, just as we are all one in Christ. Your meetings of Orthodox and Catholic laity, theologians, clergy, and hierarchs is unique in the world, and I have observed with keen interest the progress your conference has made in helping support the unity of the Church of Christ. Please be assured of my sincere prayers for your successful deliberations. The presentations of the plenary speakers and the fellowship which meetings such as Orientale Lumen Conference encourage. May God always bless you and keep you all the days of your life. Amen. So again, thank you all and everyone and uh, especially our speakers and may God bless all of you in your ministry.